Hi there, and welcome to the 2020 edition of the UAE Tech Podcast, a series of discussions on how technology is reshaping governance and economics in the United Arab Emirates. From our offices in Media City, Dubai, I'm John Lillywhite with Al Boaba Business. The region back in 2014-15 was not the numbers that you see today, was not the ecosystem that you see today. And therefore, there was a lot of feedback that this isn't really required. Um, so we pivoted away from the Tinder model towards a directory model and continued to add features like news, uh, blogs, um, We added a question and answer form, jobs, uh, all the wrong things, just adding features, hoping something will click. And I remember the moment was when uh, somebody that was sitting next to me in the co-working space said, then they could see me really struggling, said, well, you do realize you have all of this data on the platform, and yet everyone thinks this is a connection platform. Have you ever thought about publishing a piece of research around founders around investments and the first one we brought out was the state of mina startups it was me on canva designing a two three page infographic uh, that basically said how many startups were in the region how many of them received funding uh, how many of them needed funding and what were their biggest pain points and then people started going oh right well this guy's got data Second one we published was uh, a a venture report, the first venture report, which was basically an aggregation of all investments that took place in, if I remember correctly, 2016. Uh, That got all the investors' attention because there was no numbers in that space. And then we continued to publish research, which really built us traction to get to the raise of funds. uh, And then we got to where we are today. If you're a data nerd or you love statistics, you should hopefully enjoy this episode because there's definitely some surprising data out there to explore. For example, in the first half of 2020, the top five funding rounds accounted for 49% or basically half of all funding this year, with three out of five of those deals taking place before COVID-19. A total of $659 million dollars has been invested in MENA-based startups so far this year. That's 95% of the total of last year already. That said, since COVID-19, 60% of founders are facing revenue decrease and a subsequent lack of cash. But meanwhile, in Saudi Arabia, venture funding is up 102%, with a total of $95 million invested in startups. So what's going on? All of these statistics are taken from reports researched and compiled by a company called Magnet. One of the reasons for a lack of outside investment in the Middle East tech industry is a lack of reliable data. Over the past decade, venture capital has been slowly transforming the SME space, but mapping this process hasn't always been easy. This week we're speaking with Philip Bahoshi, the founder of Magnet, to go into a deep dive on the numbers behind three recently published reports. The first is Mena Venture report. The second is a sentiment report. And the third is the Saudi venture capital snapshot. So how has COVID-19 affected investment activity? What are the underlying investment trends? And how is accelerated digitalization influencing investor and government behavior across the region? Today we're talking with Philip Bahoshi of Magnet on investment and venture capital in the Middle East. Philip, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. So just very quickly, what is is Magnet? Magnet's been quite a journey over several years. Uh, We are now MENA's most comprehensive venture data platform, specifically, which is built on ultimately four core pillars. before I jump into that, effectively in its journey, we saw that there was a disconnect of the startup ecosystem offline. While it's come a huge way in the last four or five years from what it was when I started, um, 
what you saw was mini hubs being created across the region, but there was no holistic platform that would almost bring those communities together online. So unlike many other entities that focused on the offline space, the conferences, um, the events, as such, we focused on an online platform. And what we like to think is that we brought all of that together with a very uh, clear focus on data and data transparency for the region. And the current four pillars of Magnet that we've built is one which is a connection platform, ultimately allowing users to be able to connect with each other and stakeholders from the ecosystem, whether it be investors, corporates, or governments. And especially in the recent months of COVID, we've seen a huge uh, engagement online towards connectivity because you can't connect with your counterparts in the offline space. The second pillar and product is effectively data. Um, we like to think that we're the most comprehensive when it comes to startup data, investment data, investors, the startup ecosystem in general, and the information that basically drives decision making in that space. The third is a research pillar. Um, we found that data is only really as good at times as the analysis that you can put on top of that. So we publish three research reports a month. One is the venture summary of all venture activity in the space. Uh, in the last month, one is a deep dive into a specific industry and one is a uh, industry deep dive. And the fourth pillar, while we're not a media outlet, is that we curate and create content and news relevant to the venture and startup space. Um, and so that's what Magnet currently is as a platform focused in the Middle East and North Africa, looking to continue to expand into neighboring geographies uh, sometime soon. Interesting. So I think I've used Magnet in the past in a previous incarnation in terms of, you know, uploading um, your startup and, and kind of following other startups and seeing what investors are up to. But I had no idea you, you produce these reports every single month. So have you got a team of researchers and analysts and that kind of thing? Yeah, we're building the research team in-house. I think it's been clear that that was a sweet spot. It was one of the, the real differentiating factors of what Magnet was originally and what provided Magnet some level of notoriety. Um, I think in a region where there is a lack of transparency and a lack of data, being able to gather that data is somewhat of a challenge, but then being able to articulate that data for decision makers, whether they be government, corporate, investors or the wider community has uh, proven a space that we've been able to fill. I just want to caveat that this is specifically high growth tech startups, not the SME offline space, which is the niche that we're focused on. And so, yeah, we continue to build out the research capabilities of the platform. Interesting. And, and how about you? What's your background? How did you get into this? Where did the idea for Magnet come from? So I'm uh, originally British Iraqi. Uh, both my parents are uh, Iraqi and I was brought up in the UK, studied there and spent most of my life there um, until I, well, not now it's coming up to half my life there. Um, and at the age of study at LSE in London, uh, joined Oliver Wyman and their financial services practice. Um, and in one of the first projects that I had, I came out to the region where we were consulting for large financial institutions here in the region back in 2008, 2009. Uh, spent three years as a management consultant advising uh, those type of institutions, having traveled to the likes of Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, um, Kuwait, uh, UAE, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and, and really got a grasp of the region using my kind of Western education, but Middle Eastern background to, to act as a nuance. Was then uh, hired by Barclays and asked to act as chief of staff to the CEO of Barclays Wealth and Barclays Middle East, where we advised on the strategy for uh, the bank here in the region with a specific focus on Saudi Arabia at times. Um, decided that I wanted to have a break after three years and went to INSEAD where I did my MBA, uh, where I spent uh, six months in Paris in, or Fontainebleau and then six months in Singapore. Uh, following which I wanted to join the family business, did that for a period of time and decided that wasn't for me. And from that had a burning ambition to try and start something. Um, had multiple ideas, uh, and during my period of time at INSEAD, I did the Startup Bootcamp, which is an, a, a program over a weekend where you come up with an idea on a Thursday and then pitch to investors on a Sunday. And although my idea wasn't magnet, what I realized from that program is that there's a disconnect between how entrepreneurs are able to connect to the wider ecosystem. So Magnet 1.0 was effectively a Tinder platform connecting MBA entrepreneurs to MBA alumni um, to help them connect and further develop their businesses. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the birth and the origins of 
the Magnet platform. So when did Magnet start and how did you refine it just very quickly? I have to remember these dates. Uh, I, I remember it would have been late 2014, early 2015 was where I'd come up with a business plan and started getting some outsourced developers to um, build the product. I did all the wrong things despite having done every class at the MBA on venture. I was a sole founder with an outsourced team working on a niche product with no monetization. So although I should have learned, um, I didn't. And that's one of my key takeaways is that you really only learn by doing um, as much as you can read about it. Uh, sometimes you just have to jump in and learn. Um, so we started as that MBA platform, although we had a huge interest um, uh, in the product. And I was fortunate enough through my own hustle to speak to the deans of entrepreneurship from Harvard and MIT and Stanford and all of the universities in the UK uh, and Europe. Uh, what was very clear was that they all wanted it as a product for their university and not the network that I was trying to build, which had a network effect. And the feedback that I kept getting because I was doing it out of Dubai because I was residing in Dubai was how do you build a global platform for a niche market out of Dubai if you can't interact with your customers and clients. So that was another learning lesson. So I very quickly pivoted the same product to the region. The region back in 2014, 15 was not the numbers that you see today, was not the ecosystem that you see today. And therefore, there was a lot of feedback that this isn't really required. Um, so we pivoted away from the Tinder model towards a directory model and continued to add features like news, uh, blogs. Um, we added a question and answer form, jobs, uh, all the wrong things, just adding features, hoping something would click. And I remember the moment was when uh, somebody that was sitting next to me in the co-working space said, then they could see me really struggling, said, well, you do realize you have all of this data on the platform. And yet everyone thinks this is a connection platform. Have you ever thought about publishing a piece of research around founders, around investments? And the first one we brought out was the state of MENA startups. It was me on Canva designing a two, three page infographic uh, that basically said how many startups were in the region, how many of them received funding, uh, how many of them needed funding and what were their biggest pain points. And then people started going, oh, right, well, this guy's got data. Second one we published was uh, a venture report, the first venture report, which was basically an aggregation of all investments that took place in, if I remember correctly, 2016. Uh, that got all the investors' attention because there was no numbers in that space. And then we continued to publish research, which really built us traction to get to the raise of funds. Uh, and then we got to where we are today. So it was really just continual hustle and pivoting towards trying to find what the product market fit. I still don't think that we have the perfect product market fit, but we began to work out what it was that uh, people saw attraction in. Yeah, I mean, I, what is interesting is that the reports you guys are creating are definitely very well known now. Um, and based on what you just said, the best thing might be to just start going into some of those. So I've had a look at three reports you've produced. You've got the H1 sentiment report. You've got the 2020 minute venture investment report and Saudi Arabia venture capital snapshot. Um, I guess before we go into those, why, is, why are those your three headlines? Why are the, those the three things you're looking at this month or right now? Well, so I mean, back to your point earlier, why do we do the reports? Because they really saw traction and we try to educate through the platform. Like any startup, um, you need a hook to build either brand visibility, uh, to build users or to build um, awareness. And these reports um, have built their own kind of brand and uh, representation in the market. We don't actually do any um, inorganic advertising. Um, we Everything is organic from a magnet perspective. And therefore, these tools really build credibility of the brand. It builds awareness and it really tries to help uh, um, policymakers who I'm fortunate enough to be in discussion with to really benchmark themselves across the region and uh, globally. And so these three reports, one was uh, an idea that came with INSEAD during the COVID crisis to really understand what the impact of COVID-19 was on the startup ecosystem. Too many conversations were in hypotheticals as opposed to actuals. So we thought that 
now is an opportune time to just do a quick survey of the sentiment of startup investors to understand the challenges that they're facing and potentially help drive policymakers into decision making of what can be done to support them. The H1 MENA report is our staple report. We publish that every quarter. Uh, we always provide a free sample. Uh, but there is a, a, a very comprehensive 100-page report underneath that, which our su subscribers uh, can gain access to and or be purchased individually one-off. Um, and then the Saudi report has been commissioned by the Saudi Venture Capital Company, uh, which is an organization looking to drive entrepreneurship and investments in Saudi. And as they're coming from a slightly later stage of evolution of the ecosystem, they're very keen to, to track and benchmark how it is that they're doing. Uh, in the venture space, not only in the region, but internationally. So us creating this report acts as a tool for, to create transparency and visibility in that space. As COVID-19 batters economies and a historically low oil price challenges capital markets, it's worth taking a look at Magnet's 2020 sentiment report. What has been the real impact on entrepreneurs and investors? So at the moment, we have, you know, a, a low oil price. We have COVID-19 battering economies and a lot of businesses are closing. Um, so in a way, it's a very opportune time to have a look at this sentiment report. Um, what kind of setback have, have entrepreneurs and, and investors been facing at the moment? Look, I mean, the economy in general has had a massive hit. Um, society has had a massive hit. And I think uh, it's absolutely the same in the startup space. Um, I was on a call on the Dubai Future Council, which I've been invited on, and somebody very eloquently said that you effectively have three brackets of startups. You have those that were likely to fail anyway, and this just accelerated the rate at which they potentially needed to be shut down. You have those that are able to benefit from increased demand because of the pandemic, whether that be in education space, uh, healthcare, um, logistics, or food um, delivery. And those that are fundamentally decent businesses or strong businesses that have had a massive shock to their system because of the impact of COVID-19, whether that is tourism, whether that is the hospitality industry, whether that is uh, quickly growing companies that all of a sudden saw a sharp drop in demand because consumers are now more cautious on their spending. So from the startup perspective, it really has been a little bit of a shock to the system, and especially in the early days where there was mass panic. Um, Sometimes people forget that the venture model is almost designed for hyper growth. It's not meant to be for profitability. This has definitely been a bit of an awakening for people to move towards profitability over just excessive hyper growth. And when you're in that space, any given month of a lack of revenue can really create a shock to the system. So there have been companies that have definitely been challenged. Now, it's not to say that the SME market, the offline space, hasn't been challenged as well. They have. Um, but they're just kind of different dynamics. From an investor's perspective, as the report shows that the sentiment of investors is slightly more bullish or positive than it is for startups, yes, they've been affected. Yes, they have concerns for their portfolio companies and the success of those, but then they'll have multiple investments rather than just one. And they're relying on the portfolio theory that some will be performing better than others. They have a much more long-term perspective and view than the, the struggles in the short term of a potential startup. Having said that, they have their own LPs um, that will be investing in their fund that want to see the return. As you mentioned, oil prices are down. So in the region, a lot of that can be uh, a factor because they're sovereign LPs that are investing in these investors um, to continue to deploy. But they will also look to try and be more opportunist opportunistic. So currently you'll see that valuations move in favor of investors than founders because of the current growth rates that many of these startups will be facing. So there's, there's kind of different challenges and, and sentiments on both sides, but it's definitely hit the startup ecosystem in the region. Yeah, and I've seen, I've got the summary of findings in front of me. Um, it's been divided into startup challenges and, and fundraising challenges. So in startup challenges, we have 60% um, of founders are facing revenue decrease and a subsequent lack of cash. Um, 40, also, 47% struggle to find projected business plans, sorry, 41%. And 46% and and have disrupted operations. Um, so it does look like COVID-19 has had a big impact. How do you think, I mean, how, what do you think the recovery will look like 
Um, do you think people are going to get through this or do you think it's going to change, as you said, uh, it's going to, in a way, pivot towards a cash flow bringing profit in rather than hyper growth kind of um, trajectory? Well, I mean, I can take my example as a company. I mean, we quickly tried to adjust that we just wanted to try and break even as quickly as possible um, during this period and to conserve cash. Cash remains king. So those each company will be in a different position based on their cash reserves. Um, those that can weather the storm of at least six months from when this started will and continue to grow in one shape or another will be in a stronger position than they would have been um, earlier in the year, especially if they're looking to go and fundraise. Those that are strapped for cash will need to take drastic actions to kind of conserve the cash that they have available to be able to get through this challenging period. I mean, a lot of those uh, surveys don't expect this impact to be finished before the end of the year or Q1 of next year. And a certain percentage actually believe this will go into late 2021. There's too many unknowns to really know how this will really develop in the next six, 12 months. But what is clear is that there's a psychological mind shift towards cash. Uh, people will need to be much more acute to that. Certain businesses will definitely be uh, benefiting from the current environment and thriving and investment will likely go into that space. But I think that some difficult decisions will need to be made with regards to hiring, with regards to office space, with regards to licensing. One of the things that people forget is that hyper growth startups look to scale by geography. Well, many of these companies are hit by travel restrictions and inability to enter new markets. And how will that affect the business plans moving forwards? So I think it's hard to generalize, but the general sentiment is that you do need to conserve your cash, continue to grow your companies, and to continue to show some growth. And actions that you take during this period will be reflected on if you are to go and fundraise and raise further investment at a later date. So whatever actions you're taking now are very much a reflection of how you are as leaders or, or as startup founders um, seeking investment in the future. Well, there's a lot there I guess we can, we can touch on a bit later on. Um, just quickly looking under the fundraising basket, 53% of founders point to a slower pace of fundraising with fintech, edtech, and ICT accelerating their fundraising plans, but 37% of founders face fundraising challenges from un unresponsive investors. Now, again, I know this has been touched on in some of the other um, reports, but unresponsive investors, what, what does that mean, and, and how would you define that? Well, I mean... Fundraising is a challenge at the best of times. Um, it's a little bit of a game and it's like dating. Um, you, 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 at a certain point, you have to speak to several and hope that maybe one will um, uh, hit and, and take that forward. Uh, and investors are exactly the same. It is not completely unexpected at the best of times to have some investors that have bad investor behavior, don't respond to emails, don't acknowledge emails, don't uh, acknowledge uh, investment conversations, don't follow up from meetings. So that's, it's not a COVID impact. What COVID is likely to do is to create a reason for many of them to then delay or be unresponsive or unwilling to take those conversations because they have become more risk averse than they previously were. They are also in a situation where they need to analyze their strategy. They need to work out what looks best for them uh, individually and not replying to emails and people's uh, pitches is one way of doing that. So as I always say, and I learned negotiation 101 of uh, INSEAD, always put yourself in the shoes of the person that you're negotiating with and understand their circumstances. So I think that's, that's, that's part of that issue. And uh, fundraising from why people are delaying it. I mean, we were going to fundraise, we put it on hold because ultimately we know that it's a challenging environment. We know that investors are going to be uh, risk averse. If you can actually continue to grow and be in a position of strength, as I mentioned earlier, valuations are likely to be in favor of investors because they'll say, well, you may be desperate for cash. You have not shown the growth that you should. You're no longer as hot as you used to be. And therefore, if you really want this cash, then we'll give it to you at X. Whereas if you can continue to grow over a period of time, conserve your cash and be in a stronger position in six to nine months, then 
you you can stand your ground um, for the valuation or, or the investment that you're looking for, assuming that investors also come back with a higher risk appetite. Now, as you pointed out, the only industries that may be benefiting are those that are seeing unusual growth in their either revenue or traction. So you can speak to many companies in food delivery. They're seeing such a huge increase in demand for their product because people are needing that in this time of crisis. Home delivery of products, e-commerce, are seeing uncharacteristic increase in demand from people that historically weren't um, used to doing, very used to going to malls. Saudi Arabia brought out a law that uh, people cannot use cash on demand. They have to use uh, cashless services. So e-commerce and, and food logistics becomes so much easier. So the penetration of these type of products has led to big growth spurts. And what we have seen is investors investing in those industries because they don't want to miss out. Okay, so that brings us on to the H1 2020 investment report. So while it seems that sentiment in MENA um, has definitely been frustrated by COVID-19 and, and events in general, the investment report shows a slightly more complicated reality. Um, before we go into some of those numbers, which are actually quite surprising, I want to begin, begin by asking you about VC in, in the UAE, in the region generally. There's been a big buzz about uh, VC uh, in the UAE and the GCC over the past five years. And I guess I wanted to start by asking you, what is venture capital? Why is it important? And how is it different to traditional forms of investment in this part of the world? Great question. So, um, Venture is a different asset class. Um, effectively, you are taking uh, an investment in a company uh, in exchange for equity. So the, the reason that people get into the venture space is when you look at the traditional asset classes, whether it's property, whether it's um, deposits, whether it's the stock market, um, those, those are slightly more traditional asset classes. When you're getting into the venture space, you are taking ownership of companies in exchange for cash with your payoff effectively coming from an exit, uh, which signifies either being acquired, merged, or IPOing it to get a, uh, a return of investment of a multiple much higher than you would if you were going to a fixed deposit or potentially using the stock exchange. So it is a very risky asset class. And I think that's something that's very important because it is not a charity. Some founders believe it's, it's a right for them to get venture investments and that they forget that usually these venture capital entities have their own investors. So they will have larger investors, pension funds, sovereign funds, family offices, corporates that invest in the fund, looking at it as an asset class, that are looking for an exponential return on investment. Um, so when you go and be one of the early investors in Kareem and then they go and sell for uh, multiple of billions, that is a very good return on your investment. That's what they're looking for. Uh, that's the dream of the venture space. Um, and the kind of characteristics of the companies that they would invest in are tech, tech based, scalable, high growth, monetizable products, which is why sometimes in the SME space, people think that they should get venture investment. But if you're an offline business, which is a restaurant or a, or a food, uh, a clothing company, for instance, it's very different, difficult to get those type of returns uh, because it's hard to scale which is where more traditional loans or financial products are, are beneficial for those type of entities. So venture is an asset class in itself and it's risky and the people that need to get into it need to understand the risks associated with it, but the potential returns are huge if you get it right. I was speaking to someone who said, look, you know, a decade ago or 15 years ago, a lot of what we might call VC was run out of, of family offices or, or often friends of friends and increased it is, is becoming slightly more structured, more focused, more data-driven. Um, does that reflect what you, you're seeing? How, how is venture capital emerging um, in the region to, to kind of fuel the tech industry generally? I know that's a very general question, but just kind of wanted to pick your brains about that. 
Yeah, I mean, look, it was historically. I mean, venture capital start, originated in the 50s or 60s in the US, and it was built out of Silicon Valley and originally in the hardware space and then moved into the software space and opportunist. So VC is a subset of effectively of PE. PE is a, a much larger level where it's large organizations that are being bought out, uh, flipped, turned, and, and sold again. Here in the VC space, it's actually just getting... Uh, and acquiring equity in early stage companies that you believe will grow to get to a point where they get sold. So it, historically, it's already been around uh, for quite a while in the US, maybe slightly later in the 60s and 70s in Europe, and, and it's taken a while for it to get here to the region. There have been VC success stories that have dated back to uh, the 90s. Uh, you have stories like uh, Maktoub, uh, you have Souk, uh, which was originated back in the early uh, 2000s. Um, you have uh, Zawiya, which is the equi not equivalent, but very similar inspired platform, which was acquired by uh, Yahoo. Um, so those were tended to be family offices, um, individuals, uh, corporates that made bets or, or early stage investments in those types of companies. What has really grown in the last four to five years has been the almost institutionalization of that as an asset class. You have the likes of Ferdi Randur, which we, I, I call the godfather of the startup ecosystem here in the region uh, that created Wanda and uh, Wanda Capital. Uh, you have Bico Capital, MEVP, the likes that have been around since um, 2013, 2014. Um, and with the interest that you have seen by government, I think it's also important to say this has also come hand in hand with the importance of technology and digitalization. So governments being focused on trying to diversify their economies away from oil reliance services, uh, the service industry into a much needed digitalization of the region. Um, this has led to more people getting uh, into this space, um, as well as the fact that FOMO kicks in when you start seeing the returns of the exits of Souk to Amazon and uh, Kareem to uh, Uber, many people in the region who traditionally may have already been playing in this space, but in the US or Europe have now begun to shift their focus to the region. All right. Well, thanks for that overview. There's an interesting Jordanian connection there in that both Fadi, a former CEO of Aramex, and uh, uh, Maktoub, Jordanian, uh, Jordanians or Jordanian companies. Um, but no, that was a really interesting uh, overview of kind of how VC is emerging. And it'll be interesting to see where it goes. But moving on to, the, to this kind of headline statistic that we have in the uh, investment report, the venture report highlights that there's been an increase of 35% in total funding from H1 2019 to 2020, with Menabase startups receiving 659 million in the first six months of 2020. So already at 95% of 2019 funding. This was attributed to a few startups raising sizable funds such as Kitopi, um, Visita, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, um, yep. and EPMG and Jahez. So what's going on there? Um, not everything is, is awful. Well, no, it's not. I mean, I think it's, there's a couple of factors that in my forward of the report, which uh, if anyone's listening, you can uh, download for free on the website, um, basically highlights, one, that the true impact of COVID-19 has probably not completely hit. Um, we know in the venture space, as I was alluding to earlier, that it takes about nine to 12 months for companies to fundraise. So any of those companies that were raising larger rounds in, in Q1, if not into the beginnings of Q2, were likely to have already been signed at the beginning of this year and not been impacted by the first effects of COVID-19. So I think that's point number one. Point number two is that there have still been investments made by investors, either in their existing portfolio companies to support them during this challenging period, or as we mentioned earlier, uh, to opportunistically invest in the industries that are seeing increased demand during this crisis. Um, but what it has shown is that while the total amount of funding has increased, the deals have gone down, reflecting that people have investors have been making a uh, larger investment um, bet, shall we say, on 
later stage, more established companies that can navigate and overcome the current crisis, then riskier, earlier stage investments in companies that they may not be sure of. In fact, when you look at the accelerator programs, uh, you've seen a 34% drop year over year on the number of startups that have gone through early stage accelerator programs uh, because they predominantly can't take place. And therefore, that's the current reflection. But I would say that the true effects of COVID-19 will likely only come to fruition at the end of the year when you see whether people were able to fundraise now during the crisis, as opposed to those that were potentially concluding deals um, when the crisis hit. And here we've got a couple of stats. So FinTech for the third consecutive year ranked first by number of deals in H1 of 2020, 16% of all deals in MENA, followed by e-commerce at 14% and delivery and transport at 10%. Is that almost wholly explained by what you were saying about investors adapting to the new COVID-19 reality or is that something deeper in the economy? Well, I think that uh, FinTech was already uh, beginning to lead the way in the region as an industry that number one needs disruption and number two has had a lot of government focus whether it's through central banks um, and or uh, government initiatives to try and spur on the challenges in the financial services sector Um, prior to this when we did our end of year report fintech was over overtook e-commerce and transport and logistics for the first time as the industry that saw the most investment deals not the full investment amount there are other industries that see more investment capital invested in them but by number of deals um, it overtook all others and historically in any ecosystem that is relatively nascent and, and developing when we go back to what we discussed is what is it that venture entities are interested in investing in hyper scalable products in with a, a solution to a problem using technology um, with uh, monetization um, and mass scale and so e-commerce tends to be the first mover followed by transport and logistics uh, predominantly because they are infrastructure pain points that can be solved for using technology as we are seeing now uh, especially during the covid crisis fintech was the next industry to be disrupted where there is a lot of infrastructure pain point and our report last year highlighted that 50 percent of those investments are in very plain vanilla fintech solutions of transfer payments remittance payments effectively the same as picking up and dropping off somebody in a car or picking up a product and dropping it at your home picking up money and dropping it into somebody's account from a financial services perspective. So I think that's a a continuation of that trend, which is even more acute during this current period. So feeding into that, let's, let's move on to this, this final report, um, the Saudi Arabia report, um, which actually, you know, I'm I'm looking at now and uh, takes some getting your head around. So KSA ranks third in the Middle East uh, after Egypt and UAE in terms of number of deals. But startup funding in Saudi Arabia has grown 102% in this year, surpassed all investment in 2019 already, despite the crisis and, and despite what's happening you know, in the wider oil economy, with Saudi Arabia startups accounting for 95 million uh, of venture funding, invest, investing in 45 deals. So what is going on in Saudi Arabia? So I think without repeating what I said earlier about the delay in fundraising, I think to a certain extent that plays the same part. We saw some massive deals that took place earlier in this year um, with the likes of Na'na, you saw Jahez, Noon, all of which are in industries that have um, seen positive impact from COVID-19, whether it's food delivery, whether it's e-commerce, whether it's uh, education. The second thing is that and this is not a criticism, it's a reality, is that the the ecosystem in Saudi Arabia has been somewhat more uh, later than than those in the UAE, potentially, or or even Egypt, or or Jordan, or Lebanon, which have been around for for longer. Government focus at a Vision 2030 perspective in the kingdom, uh, which has been brought about in the last couple of years, has also been translated down to the startup ecosystem, where we have seen a bigger effort across organizations like MISA, which is the newly formed Ministry of uh, Investments, uh, SBC, who uh, sponsored this report, Munch'at, which is the SME authority, focusing on developing a startup ecosystem in Saudi Arabia. And what this genuinely shows is a a growth, a a success in the policies uh, that they have put in place with regard to capital. 
Um, but they need this to continue to, to really grow in, in this space. And in the dynamics of the region where the UAE is one of the most developed and where some of the most developed later stage startups are headquarters, as a market size, and this is just the reality, it is a fraction of the market size and uh, addressable market of Saudi Arabia and Egypt. And therefore, as people are now not just in the tech space, but in the business space, being able to become more welcome and open to business in Saudi, you're going to continue to see companies benefiting from that open market and growth rates uh, within the kingdom. So I expect that trend to continue. In the Saudi VC snapshot, e-commerce secured the top spot as the most active industry by birth total funding at 67%, a number of deals at 22%. Is this related to a new cashless payment law in Saudi Arabia or are other deeper factors at play? I think, as I alluded to earlier, in any ecosystem, the, the first movers tend to be e-commerce because investors understand that model. There are proven models for how e-commerce companies can grow. It is an identifiable pain point which can be kind of overcome. And therefore, it is the first kind of industry in which you can create those solutions. So I think it's a reflection of that. I think there's definitely been an acceleration because it's the first mover tech ad advantage in that space, governments have tried to ease legislation, regulation around that for them to be able to flourish. But when you then see uh, the ones that are also coming up, you look at education, fintech, um, et cetera, you're seeing the same parallel examples just two, three years behind. So if you were to look at a chart like this in, in the MENA region two, three years ago, it would be very similar. That's fascinating. And I know five years ago, um, you know, there are a lot of entrepreneurs out there trying, you know, education startups in Arabic and education apps, and uh, they really thought it was the future. And, and obviously, a lot of those startups had, had big problems monetizing. So it is really interesting to see COVID-19 kind of accelerating those trends. It'd be interesting to see where, where education, digital education ends up in a couple of years. Um, there is a note about the role of government in Saudi Arabia. So there's a note about how the Ministry of Finance, I think GOSI and SAMA, uh, their acronyms including the report, have launched support measures um, to, to help small companies. Has that, again, played a role? Has that been successful or, or, or an interesting case study in Saudi Arabia? Absolutely. I think that there were a lot of government initiatives um, that were quickly activated in Saudi to try and support specifically Saudi-based companies. Um, and I think government support is, is very important to see and maintain the growth of the startup ecosystem. Uh, a lot of energy, effort, time and investment has been put into building these ecosystems. And um, it would be a shame for that to have to be dissipated if actions weren't taken now to see the long-term return. Now, it's also fair to appreciate that the first concern is the uh, safety of people uh, and the security of, uh, of their geographies. And, and usually that those are the top priorities. But at the same time, the actions that the governments are taking now will reflect the growth in the years to come. And I think in Saudi Arabia, a lot of efforts were put in place to try and support startups at this stage um, as they continue to grow with their growth trajectory. That's interesting. So it suggests, you know, government in, in Saudi Arabia itself is becoming a little bit more leaner and, and a little bit more um, startup friendly, um, which is interesting. And on that point, um, we kind of have an introduction to what's going on in Saudi Arabia from, from one of your reports and one of your analysts. And it says that Saudi Arabia has seen an increase of over 1,400% in total funding, 275% increase in number of deals between 2015 to 2020, so over a five-year period. Um, and there's a note saying, while the local ecosystem is nascent to international heavyweights, such as the US, Europe, or China, initial growth is beginning. The number of international investors in Saudi Arabia has grown with 500 startups setting up an accelerator at the Minsk, Minsk Innovation um, Accelerator Program in 2019. And the Ministry of Investment has focused heavily on attracting international VCs to the kingdom. So there is movement there, but, but as a lot of us know in the region, the legal regime in Saudi Arabia, the getting a residency, opening a bank account, um, owning a company, you know, uh, with, with your own shares rather than having a local partner. Is that changing in Saudi Arabia on the ground? I think that, uh, for instance, the, oh, and I, 
I agree that the government has done a huge amount of effort for this. Uh, MISA, which previously was SAGIA, which was the Saudi Arabian General Investment Authority and now the Minister, uh, Ministry of Investments, just that change shows the importance of investments, foreign investments and investments in this space. And a gentleman called uh, Dr. Mazen, uh, Zaidi is responsible for entrepreneurship at the Ministry of Investments and his mandate is to try and make it easier for startups to be able to scale into Saudi Arabia to set up, I, I believe, that the license cost just for MISA is $500 now to be able to have effectively your key to the door. Then you need to go through the process of actually setting up in the kingdom. But they have tried to make it easier for companies uh, than ever before to be able to scale and grow. Because I think that they also completely understand and appreciate it's not about just building an ecosystem in Saudi. It's about being able to facilitate intellectual capital, transfer talent, from other markets into Saudi and for Saudi-based startups to be able to scale out. So I think that that is definitely acutely on their mind. Those are the, the three reports. I think the overview that it, it provides on the region and activity is, is quite fascinating. Could probably spend um, a long time studying it all. But, you know, in terms of, a, a, of an overview, what do you see as, as the key trends, as the, as the as the key um, factors that are, that are pushing a lot of activity, both for founders and for investors? Um, so I think for, for, for this year, it'll be cash conservation, continued growth. Remember that the actions you take as a founder to your teams and in general and your customers uh, will be reflected when you come to fundraise. I think that we will begin to see increased appetite from investors. The panic at the beginning has now subsided and investors do have cash in certain circumstances that needs to be deployed. I think being able to scale will continue to be a challenge until transport and travel becomes easier. So people need to be wiser on how they deploy and invest that. I think certain industries will definitely benefit and I think that they will stay. Um, I think you will see changes in behavior for e-commerce, uh, transport, education, healthcare. Uh, and one of the things that are very important is whatever you create now as a product needs to be able to be maintained post COVID. It's not good enough to just create a COVID crisis product. It needs to be something that needs to be longer term in terms of um, solution. But given the current environment, now is a time where you can actually effectively uh, create new solutions that you previously may not have been thinking about because of the current circumstances. I think governments will continue to try and invest in this space because I think that it's needed. That will vary across the region in different ways. Um, and I think that investor appetite will see opportunities, whether it be in um, valuations, mergers. We've yet to see an uptick. It was something I predicted that would happen. We haven't seen it happen yet. As companies uh, see cash difficulties, there'll be opportunities for companies to kind of merge and become bigger entities in the region. And I think the international interest in the region, um, as they... Uh, continue to grow in the way that the stock market continues to go up, may see opportunities in the region. So um, I'm cautiously optimistic, but again, a lot of this can be challenged by whatever the impact of COVID-19 is. If we have a second shutdown, if we're, I think people are now adapted to a new norm. Uh, the, the, the question is uh, how that can basically influence the startup ecosystem in this space. So Philip Bahoshi, thank you so much for your time. And just finally, if we want to have access to these reports or find out more about your business, where can we find you? So all of these three reports are available um, for free on the website. You can go to magnet.com slash research. Uh, if you're interested in a subscription to the data, to all of the research and any export of the data, you can get that through several subscription uh, products on the platform, or you can purchase any of the deep dives of these products uh, directly online individually. Thanks a lot, Philip. Have a great day. Thank you very much. 